everyone. How's everyone doing? Welcome to Shiona Turini's Masterclass. Today we are going to talk about fashion in the digital age. Like many of you, I follow Shiona on Instagram and she has built a solid following over the years. However, apart from her solid digital following. She also has vast experience. She's worked for dozens of publications and magazines from Teen Vogue to Cosmopolitan, which is the biggest women's magazine in the world. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Shiona Tarini. Please give her a big round of applause. Make her feel welcome. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you all for coming out. I can't believe so many of you came. <laughs> yeah, so many people. It's a packed house. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, great. So I read a story about how you got started in the fashion industry. Something about you going to Yves Saint Laurent and like going back over and over and demanding a job. Is that true? Yeah, that is the story that will never die <laughs> and proves that I am a stalker. So... <laughs> Um, I am not American, so when I realized that I wanted to work in fashion, I realized that I had a huge hurdle that other people may not have, which was U.S. citizenship or a green card or a visa. And, um, but I did go to college in America, which at that time gave me a visa called an OPT, which is Optional Practical Training, and who wouldn't take advantage of that? So um, I didn't know that much about fashion internationally, except that I knew that I wanted to be in it. So I knew of, I had one favorite brand, it was Yves Saint Laurent, because they were the first brand to put black models on the runway. Um, and so I, I did show up, I started, uh, I showed up first for a school project, which was to shadow someone whose job you wanted. And then she had casually mentioned like, oh, to work in fashion, you should do an internship. And I was like, how do you get one? And she's like, you can intern for me, which I was like, oh, I'm hired, it's my job. <laughs> So I showed up in New York City and I was like, hi, I'm here for my internship. And they were like, what are you talking about? Like, oh. that's not how this works. And so I went, I'll never forget, I went to the McDonald's, I cried. Um, and then I was like, I'm just gonna show up tomorrow. Like, what's the worst that could happen? I showed up the next day, they were like, girl, bye. And then I was like, I'm gonna give it one more shot. And so I showed up that third day and I overheard one of the girls saying that she had a hangover. And I was like, I'll go get you a coffee. And she was like, okay, you can be my intern. And so that's how I started. And I interned with them. I put in an entire year unpaid, which I know it was really difficult to do. But at the end of that year, they offered me a job. So that was how I got my first, my first job in fashion. Wow. So what would you say to people here looking to get into the fashion industry? What tips would you give them? I would say, like I was told, that an internship is key. And I know that that's probably like the most cliche response ever. But I had no experience. At that point, I didn't know who Anna Wintour was. I didn't, I didn't know the landscape and the different jobs that were in fashion. And so that internship kind of opened my eyes that, you know, I could have a law degree because of course, you know, Vuitton needs a lawyer because they're gonna sue somebody. Mm -hmm. So I, I think having that experience showed me all of the different departments and it helped me kind of refine what I wanted to do and helped me set my strategy of where I wanted to go in the industry. Okay, so in Nigeria, we don't have an internship culture per se. So not a lot of companies offer internships as much as you would see in like America. So for people looking for internships here, do you say just go ahead? What would you? I mean, I don't know all of the laws here about like, you know, working for free or for very little to get experience. But I would say if a traditional internship is not the, the route that's here, it's like find, make a list of companies that you would want to work at and just research, research, research. Because even if you're working, you know, what you might not think is an important role within a company, you're still within that company and you're still able to observe what's happening within that company. 
So it might not be like your dream job, but if you kind of have an idea of where you would want to work, start there and be open to other positions. When I was at Yves Saint Laurent, they actually offered me the receptionist job. And so I had to consider things like that before getting the role that I wanted. But I knew that that was the company I wanted to be at. Um, the beauty about the digital age is you might not need an internship to get experience because you're kind of creating your own opportunities. With things like Instagram, you're able to show your point of view and your aesthetic. So it's a little different now and I wouldn't say, I think that internships are still important, but there are other jobs within companies that can give you that experience. So speaking about Instagram, you're Insta-famous. <laughs> That's the name of your class. But um, what would you say to people looking to build their brands on Instagram and using social media as a platform to do that? I think that Instagram is a blessing and a curse. Um, I obviously see how important it is, especially for people who are creative and people who want to work in fashion. But Instagram has also kind of created this environment where everyone's a creative director. Everyone is like a fashion director and it's like, sure, you are the fashion director of your Instagram, but like what else? So um, while I think that it's amazing to be able to show your aesthetic and create your own content and show the rest of the world what you're able to do, I do think that you have to be realistic and um, really tell that story about yourself from a natural, more organic way and not to fake it. Okay, so you've been part of You've styled some of the most iconic videos, and I know you have collaborated with Solange and Beyonce, so I just wanna talk about video styling. So can you take us through your creative process? What do people here want to know how you, from the mood board to the execution, can you just take us through? Well, everyone works very differently, and so even though I work for myself, when I'm styling a video or working on a video project, I still have a boss. And that boss is either the talent or the director, or I mean, sometimes it's like a board of like 10 people that I have to answer to. So the starting point is different depending kind of on who I'm reporting to. But after I get the general scope of direction, whether it is from a treatment, because music videos typically use treatments, um, or for like a commercial, which uses a treatment, but kind of here is what we want to say visually, and these are the things you need to achieve that. I see how I want to create that story using clothing. So that's step one. So I'll take someone's initial treatment, and then I'll build what I call mood boards. So that's like pulling images, whether archival images, things I find on the internet, a girl walking down the street, and just think about how I want to convey that person's message, um, which is the same in all areas of styling, even when you're working with a person. It's like, what are you gonna say using clothing and using this picture and using this video? Um, a lot of times I think people are surprised that Sometimes you don't hear the song until you get on set. So you're really working off of this treatment that someone, usually the director, has created and saying like, oh, well, I read in the treatment that it says like X, Y, Z, maybe like a really bright red dress in the middle of the ocean could look beautiful there. And then you put together those boards, show it to whomever you're reporting to, and you build the story upon that. Okay. Okay, can you so, take us? Yeah. This, I recently styled a Nike commercial that was very important to me because it, um, the message was equality. Um, and we prepped this job twice because things sometimes get canceled out of thin air. And um, I worked with a director that I do a lot of work with. Her name is Melina Matsukis, And she has a very um, clear point of view. She's really interested in clothes. So I know that when I'm working with her, like I gotta bring it. Like I have to do my best work. She really pushes me. So for this, um, she had her story of how she wanted the commercial to look. And then I kind of pulled these like sports focused references just to say like, how are we gonna convey this message? How do we wanna show kind of equality? How do we wanna like give even though it's a sportswear brand, a more fashion feel. So these were some of the mood boards that my team and I came up with. You can just so that was for Gabby Douglas's scene. Um, we really wanted to show women 
of all cultures kind of participated in sports. That was something very important to Melina, myself, and Nike. So this was our running board. And then this was Michael B. Jordan that they wanted to show kind of boxing, but with a gritty feel. And this is kind of how we put that all together. Oh. Went too far. Oh. That wasn't me. Is this the land history promise? So one day we had 500 extras that we had to dress. We couldn't let them here, come dress. within these them. lines. Here, you're defined by your actions, not your looks or beliefs. Equality should have no boundaries. The bonds we find here should run past these lines. Opportunity should not discriminate. The ball should bounce the same for everyone. Worth should outshine color. If we can be equals here, we can be equals everywhere. That was one of my most favorite uh, projects. And I mean, I am not a sporty girl. So when they were like, you're gonna dress two football teams, I was Googling, what do football players wear? And I, so I, it was a learning process for me. And it was really powerful because every person in a leading position, so me directing a style team, Melina directing everybody, were all black females because for us, it's super important to kind of hire women and hire black people and have a diverse set. So it was really great to look around the set and see like all of these black people that you don't usually see on a commercial set in that way. And for like Nike to support that and encourage that. Um, the difficult part was like me figuring out what a football player wears, so <laughs> got it done. So that was another project that I worked on with Melina. Um, and it was obviously such a huge undertaking that there were three style teams. And um, Melina had, I had just left LA and Melina called me and was like, I need you to come back to LA to work on this other project. And I was like, I've actually never done a music video before and um, that feels like a lot of pressure, so no thank you. And she called me back and she was like, oh, let's just do it, we can split it up. Because I think that, an important part of being successful in this industry is actually being able to say no and knowing your limitations. And I knew that to be given such a short amount of time to pull together something that I knew would be visually impactful and also have a huge impact on the culture was not to be taken lightly. And I didn't want to just say, oh yeah, sure, and kind of like fail at it. So we had three different style teams. I got to work with some amazing people and I think it was magic. I, I obviously loved that project and it was great to work on that. But again, it started with that same treatment and figuring out like, okay, what clothes are going to convey what message? And there were certain things where like, you know, we're touching visually on very serious issues in our community, but we still want to be fashion. And how do you do that without being offensive? Lovely. So Solange. Cranes is one of my favorite videos. And like I know Don't Touch My Hair as well, you worked on that as well. So can you talk about collaborating with Solange and creating all these looks? Collaborating with Solange is very special because she has, she's so decisive and she's, 
she knows what she wants, she knows how she wants to look, and I'm just there to be like the supporting actress to her like final vision. Um, so with Solange, you take a lot of direction and you really have to like bring your best work and she's really focused in supporting new talent. So it's about searching for young up and coming designers, like getting an outfit from a museum in Croatia that actually like happened. So it really, I like to say working with her and working on these videos was like a scavenger hunt. Like I was searching all over the world for kind of new brands and young people to collaborate with to kind of create what she saw in her mind and help that come to life on the screen. We shot that over a period of maybe like a month. And at one point, um, we were just like on a tour bus going through the south and jumping off and shooting things. You know, I'm actually in the video, thank you. <laughs> but only because one of the models couldn't get to where we were shooting. And she was like, you're going to have to put this on. So it was like very organic. And, you know, I think, I think we came up with something really beautiful. All right. So creating content. You've collaborated with Stuart Wiseman, and you've done things with Oscar de la Renta and all these brands. So can you take us through your collaboration process and creating appealing content for brands? Um, yeah. Creating content for brands, I think, is much like creating content for your own Instagram. It's kind of like identifying what you want to say or what visuals you want to put out to the world and how you want someone else to see your aesthetic. Um, just with brands, it's like very specific and you have a job, you have to do it. They have a product, you need to show it. So it's actually one of my favorite things to do is to work with a brand because they see the product and they see the brand in one specific way and being able to come in as a consultant and um, give them fresh ideas and show them how they can interpret their product differently is a challenge because no one ever wants to approve anything, but when it does get approved, I, I think it, it turns out pretty well. So these were some things that I created for Oscar de la Renta's new collection. They have two young new designers, and so you know it's like we're using Instagram to help put out their new message, which is a big job. Um, another project I worked on and another brand I work with a lot is Christian Dior and it's the same thing, creating um, different ways to look at their products. So styling it differently than what you see on the runway, working with like young and upcoming influencers um, and just communicating the message like that. This we did in collaboration with Bergdorf Goodman, which I loved that because Dior didn't sell products online until we worked on these projects. So I actually got to see, we created these images and X amount of products sold. The shoes actually sold out. So it was, it was amazing to actually see how Instagram and these digital campaigns result into sales. Okay. So this was a video that we got to create for Dior to sell the shoes the first time around. That's me. So that was a video that we got to create that again was Instagram based. And so it's like right now, if you're not creating video content for your Instagram, then you are behind. It's everything that you need to be focused on. You should be like, you know, just making videos using apps on your own to kind of produce video content because that's where we see the most engagement and that's also what's getting like shared the most right now. And so for Dior and Bergdorf Goodman, 
I mean, I'm not a director, but I can figure it out. So if I can figure it out, you guys can figure it out. So we kind of cast that video, styled it, and um, filmed it on our own. And sometimes the videos that my team and I are producing are just in-house with iPhones. I mean, that wasn't with an iPhone, but we do that. What about matches? Now I'm in this like weird editor slash influencer stage, so a lot of times I find myself having to be the subject as well as like producing, directing, finding the photographer. And I like it because I am in complete control of how the images turn out. So that was again a project that I did with Matches. They wanted me to show how I styled items on myself and then that led into how it was presented for sales online. So how do you infuse your personal brand into these kind of collaborations? And how can you give tips for people looking to build their personal brand as opposed to a business one? I mean, I, that's a great question. I think it's very important to, well, obviously it's super important to build your personal brand. And I think it's important to stick to your aesthetic. Like I said, like no one wants to see someone faking it. For me, everybody knows I'm gonna throw a crop top in there. I'm gonna throw a high waist. Um, pan, I'm gonna throw what I think is an amazing shoe. And I have a formula. And so that formula, you either are into it or you're not. And if you're not, you're not following me. And so it's like, okay, bye. So I only really have to concern myself with my followers. I do inject that into brands and I do inject that into styling clients, but I also realize that as a stylist and when you're doing it for work, you can't just stick to your aesthetic and you have to kind of experiment and explore other points of reference and points of views. But I think when you're building your own personal brand to have a specific aesthetic that you stick to is great because it becomes your signature. It also helps you get dressed a lot faster, to be honest, but yeah. Exactly. And this is just some examples of my styling work that I've done for clients like a Stuart Weitzman, which is digital and e-commerce based. So we can just move on. How did you make the switch from PR to editorial styling? How did you? I had been doing public relations for about three years and then um, I just wanted a new experience. And so a job opened at W Magazine to be the accessories editor. And um, they called and I was like, would you be interested in this? they referenced a very specific situation that had happened where one of the stylists who was pretty major wanted these gold hoop earrings and they would not stop stalking me about these gold hoop earrings that I could not get from Paris. So I went to Claire's and bought her some earrings and I was like, there's your earrings. And um, they didn't know that that's what I did, but to them I found a solution and I made that stylist happy. So they wanted me to come and interview to work in editorial and it seemed super exciting. I love storytelling through styling, through clothing, through images and I made the switch to editorial. I didn't start styling within magazines for many years though. I went to work for a stylist, Corrine Reitfeld, and she was launching a magazine in America and I only got the opportunity to style just because there was no one else to do it. Like we were a team of three so after I proved that, or after she believed that I had good taste, she started to give me um, styling opportunities. And it developed from there. Okay, great. Let's see some of your work. Yeah. Oh, you can see. Oh. Sorry. We're just This was one of my favorite stories. It was for Nylon Magazine, and they knew they wanted to do a nude story. So a magazine might call me and say, either what do you want to do, or we need to shoot X, Y, Z. So for this, they were like, nude is a huge trend. We'd like to shoot it. And um, I was very much into it because I loved the idea of showing different nudes on different skin tones. So it was like, if I can do like eight models, fine. And it was the week of, I guess, Thanksgiving or right before Christmas. No one was around, but somehow we pulled it together and I was really happy with how this turned out. I thought we had like a super diverse cast and I just, this is one of my favorite stories to date. 
Another thing that I'll never say no to if someone is like, oh, you can shoot this and you can also shoot it in Bermuda. I think it's so important to stay very close to your roots and where you came from. I feel like that is something that Nigerians can take advantage of because the world is watching and now with Instagram, the world is so small. So, you know, we, I feel like everyone loves to see something explored in a different culture or shown a different way. So that's something that I try and do all the time in Bermuda like shoot there, shoot Bermudian models. <laughs> People love this story. Obviously, celebrity styling has to be a part of your job, well, my job, if I want to be a stylist. So this was a story that I got to do with New York Mag for Future. Um, I think he is like, one of our generation's kind of style icons when it comes to menswear. And it was great to balance that streetwear also with just like the over-the-top accessories that I feel like hip-hop is known for, that I love to celebrate. And this is Issa Rae. Do you guys watch Insecure? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Love Insecure. Um, so this was really fun. She's as hilarious in person as you think she is. Um, but she, and she kind of wanted something that was true to herself to look like she got dressed herself. And she looks so amazing in color. So we went with this Oscar de la Renta sweater for this. And it was a video and a shoot. Okay, so influencers. Can we talk about creating mini meaningful relationships between influencers and brands? Influencers are really important in the fashion space right now. Who are the Nigerian influencers? Um, there's some of them here. I'm not going to point anyone out, <laughs> but they know who they are. We have a few. Yeah. The word influencers gets thrown out a lot in Nigeria, actually. It's kind yeah. of like a new buzzword and stuff, but we do have... We do have a few key ones. Yeah. yeah. I mean, right now in fashion, I think it's a fine line because you want to have authentic um, relationships with influencers and brands. But at the same time, brands still want exposure. So something that I do when working with brands is finding them the right influencers for their product. Usually it's someone that already supports the product. So if you are an influencer or want to be an influencer and you would like a collaboration with a brand eventually, it's so important to already post that brand, already create content around that brand to kind of get the attention. And so when they do a collaboration with you, it doesn't seem fake. I have desperately been trying to get Nivea to give me a contract because I live and die by it. I post it all the time because I love it, not because I want a project to come out of it in the future, but that would be like the icing on the cake. So when I'm working with brands and trying to find influencers for them that fit, I always start with who already supports this and who feels right and who feels honest. Because so much on the internet is a lie. <laughs> this was a recent project for Oscar de la Renta that we did and it was around Fashion Week and it was to um, kind of get people wearing the new brands and the new designs. So we focused on, although it's based in America, we focused on Paris Fashion Week to create the content just because that's usually when people interested in fashion are on the internet and looking at Instagram. And so we created quite a few collaborations and campaigns with different people. And this was the Dior Bergdorf um, project that we did two years in a row. So celebrity dressing. You've dressed many celebrities. Is it much different from editorial styling and video styling? It is because you have people that are going to tell you no. So the, I think the blessing and the curse with celebrity dressing is that it's a real person. And so you don't want to stray so far from that person's aesthetic, even if it may, might not be yours. And that's something that sometimes it takes me a second to wrap my head around because I'll be like, these shoes are so ugly, but I know this person's gonna love them and I wanna make my client happy. So it's kind of balancing what you think is great, but also what that makes that person happy. Aren't you? Just... Those are just a few. And that's okay, it. Okay, that's it. I'm gonna open the floor. Can we get a round of applause for Shiona?
Thank you so much. So I'm sure there's so many questions. So can we just can you just raise your hand if you want the microphone given to you? Hello. Hi. My name is Rhoda, and I'm trying to be a stylist, and I really enjoy your tips. So I would like to ask, how do you get a celebrity or let's say someone you're meeting for the first time to get comfortable with a particular outfit you're putting together. Let's say they have their own opinion of how they want to look, but you think this is something better that they should try. How do you get them comfortable with it? Thank you. That is a million dollar question. It's something that I struggle with all the time. I think it's something that all stylists struggle with because obviously I'm like, this looks great. And the celebrity or the talent might be like, I hate this. So it's about finding that balance again. I try and make sure that whoever I'm working with, I have a very clear idea on their aesthetic and what sort of message they want to convey with their clothes. And sometimes it just doesn't work. Sometimes it's just a disagreement. And sometimes I think maybe things didn't look as best as they could. But my first priority is to make sure whomever I'm working with is happy and comfortable. And so I have to put all of my, you know, I have to put a lot of what I really want to see them in to the wayside and just make sure that they're happy and they're comfortable and hope that we reach a middle ground. Sometimes it is smooth sailing and they're like, okay, I trust you, that's good. But especially when working with a new person, they usually come to the table with their own ideas and it's about having that communication open and making sure that everybody is comfortable. A lot of times talent might have other people above them that are like, we want to change X, Y, Z, and that's another struggle that's like added to that pot. So it's an effort, but you have to, I think it's important to just make sure that person is happy. My first question is, when are you following me back on this? <laughs> Right I'll now. probably right now. That was a pretty good question. <laughs> What's your Instagram handle? Tell me. I'm a doing. Hey. <laughs> Baruki Daniel. What is it? Baruki Daniel. I have to. Can have you spell to. it? Yes, it's spelled. M B A. M B A. M B A. W U. W. U. W U. Underscore Daniel. Yeah, underscore Daniel. That's it. Hey. It's loading. <laughs> the Wi-Fi here. It's not me. But I'll keep it open. I'm going to screenshot it. I promise you. Okay. So the second one is, I noticed um, people don't, people like your pictures. Can you like, bring this? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Much so um, I noticed people probably like your pictures. Like if you started up your brand and stuff and you have people on your page, people like it and then people don't please others. How do you make the likes turn into others? Well, I'm not personally selling anything on my Instagram except for my services. So, um, but when I'm working with a brand, you're asking how I make sure that the brand is, it's translated. Well, first of all, it's understanding that brand's audience and um, kind of researching their shopping habits. So. Um, a great service that Instagram now has for businesses is where you can track the analytics. Like, so you find out what time um, the most people following you are posting. I know that globally between the hours of 12 and 4 are very popular times. So if you're trying to get your engagement up, you should really try and be posting during those hours. I know that this is for the US. I have to be honest. I mean, I don't know like the global landscape of those analytics. So it's posting at times that most of your audience is online and it's knowing kind of what they're gonna respond to. Like sometimes, you know, I'm having a bad day and I wanna just like post myself on my couch, but no one wants to see that. They wanna be like, what's the look? They don't care. They don't wanna see pictures of my nephews. They wanna know like, what are you wearing? So I think understanding your audience and pretty much giving the people what they want. And then um, as far as tracking how sales are happening, obviously like link in bio and things like that will give you a fair representation of of what's being sold. Thanks. I'm gonna follow you. I like your jacket. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Tosin. Thank you, Shiona. Um, my question is, um, has there been any time in your career, maybe when you're just starting up, or maybe recently, or any time that you put something together, like some jobs, and it was totally torn down? <laughs> how did you handle that? How did you, 
you know, did you have to start all over again? I mean, do you have to maybe, re, I mean, re-strategize and all of that? How did you deal with that? I mean, that happens a lot. I, the misconception is that everything that I do is like beautiful and, you know, golden and great, but I get turned on all the time. So if I have five projects or five successful ideas, I probably submit it up to 25. So I think to avoid some of the back and forth when I'm working with clients is to make sure that I'm presenting a range of ideas to them. I try not to get tunnel vision and I also really try not to get emotionally attached to an idea or an outfit because that has ended up with like, you know, me in a bathroom, like, ugh, why, like, why is this happening to me? So kind of taking out the emotion and just recognizing that while this is fun and it's exciting and it's beautiful, it's a job. It's a job just like if I was going to the bank every day as a teller. So I have to kind of like take my emotions out of it, which is really, really, really difficult for creative people because we get so invested in our creativity and we want to think that everything that we do is great. But sometimes it's just not and you have to accept the fact. So I try and over prepare if I'm working with a celebrity I try and make sure that I have like five outfits I love so that hopefully one of those outfits will work out and I don't have to kind of rework it when I'm on set or when I'm in front of them because then I get like you know disappointed so over preparation and not to take it personally and just say like I'm fabulous okay you want that ugly outfit no problem I'll give it to you but like move on my name is Eberi and I'm a fashion digital marketer. And um, I've been in the digital marketing space for six months. There's this gap where I'm not the very fashion person. I like to keep myself inside. So I'm wondering what skills do I need to get or what people do I need to work with to be able to bridge that gap? I'm all about the marketing, the digital aspect, but then I need to be able to um, be able to send the message out there, like have um, create the right content, get editors or stylists. So who do I need to work with to be able to bridge that gap? So what is your end goal? Can you keep the mic? Okay. My end goal would be to, because um, the, number for, uh, the number on the people who get to use social media and internet is not reducing anytime soon. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So for small, medium businesses and large businesses. It gives everyone an opportunity for you to sell your products. So I just want to help people leverage social media, leverage the internet to be able to sell their products, sell their brands, and hopefully sell Africa fashion. Right. Um, if you're talking about just like Instagram based, like growth, again, it's important like the times you post, the frequency you post. I, I can only manage to post maybe once a day, if that. But I do know statistically, if you're posting twice a day, you're going to increase your reach because of the algorithms, which does not sound very interesting, but it's like actually proven. Um, and I, I know I mentioned it earlier, but video. So for your clients and for yourself, you should be f focusing on video, whether it's just like a boomerang or Instagram based apps or kind of producing them yourself or if you have the budget with a production team. I understand that part. I understand the tools, the time, the algorithm and uh -huh. all that. The point where I haven't gotten is to be able to create the content that attracts people. So uh. I'm not a very, uh, I'm not very creative in the styling area. So I was wondering, do I need to get skills in um, content creation for the fashion industry? Or do I just basically work with some people who are already good at that to be able to um, get, yes. get that? I out? think it would be helpful if you see the type of content that you like on the internet and uh, to identify who's producing that. And if you're able to, go work for them. Like even ask them like, oh, I'd like to help you out in that if they're not hiring. And so you're understanding how they're creating it, what sort of photographers they're working with, um, just like how they're building that content because everyone needs help. And I feel like most people are very open to teaching someone so that they can get that help. And in the process, you're learning valuable skills that you don't think that you have as far as like creative direction and creating that sort of content. So I would identify the type of content you like, who's creating it, and volunteer your services so that you can learn. Thank you. You're welcome. My name is Adesi. Um, I saw your videos on your project you worked on. And most of them send a deep message. Now, I've been a sales and service-oriented person. I'm aware time is money, and I'm conscious of that. 
Now, I want to ask, what constitutes your time frame for every specific project you run? Can you repeat that bit? What constitutes your time frame? Oh. You earlier said one took you a month. Now, do you determine that or is it, is it determined by you putting up everything to go for that project or the person you're shooting it for determines the project, the time frame for the project? It's a little bit of both. I'm a workhorse, so I could work all day, every day. I'm sure my team does not enjoy that. But when I'm working on a project, I like the turnaround to be like super fast. Um, but it does depend on the videographer or the photographer, um, which is why I like to do so much of it myself. So uh, most of the time, it's determined the turnaround time necessary for the brand or the company or the person. But if I'm doing it and I have that call, it's usually super fast because I like to like get something done, over with, move on to the next one. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Um, my name is Oni Makoli. Um, I want to ask, how do you deal with pricing, particularly with clients that... How do I do what? I'm sorry. Deal with pricing. Okay. Now, there are clients that see your work, they love your work, they like it, they're following all the time, and they want your services at times, but they're not, they not ready to pay but they just want your service, they love it, but they just want to keep on the pricing. So much that even if you choose to want to go ahead to keep doing it for the, lo for the fact that you love what you're doing, over time you, you, they, they probably will just send you out of business. Yeah, um, that's a good question. When I first started to work for myself, it was, pricing was a difficulty for me because I didn't want to charge too much and lose the client and I didn't want to charge too little and sell myself short. So when I am dealing with pricing, sometimes I will take a client that I know the rate is great, and then I will balance it with the more creative projects where the rate is not always so amazing. And I still do this at this point in my career because I find that when you're able to be your most creative and not have to, not really put so much focus on like the coin that's gonna come of it, a lot of times that's my best work. And when I am doing a bigger project where the rate might be great, it's a more commercial client. So I try and like balance where I'm getting my money and where I'm like kind of having that creative soul being fed. So I still do it. Sometimes I still do projects for free if it's something that I really believe in. I'll still do things at a reduced rate if I you know, love it, love the brand, or love the person. But I, I mean, I got bills to pay, so I also balance that with actual, what I call real jobs and real, real live money. But I try and still keep the balance. So, but it, it is difficult to have those conversations. And sometimes it's, or all the time, I think it's best to have someone else to have that conversation for you because I realized when I first started to work for myself, I was getting so caught up in the conversations about money that I couldn't focus on the creative. So I had to like relinquish that bit of control and have someone else do it. And in the beginning, I was letting my sister do it. And I was like, this is kind of what I want to make on this project, talk to this person, see what happens. But now I have um, a real manager. Thank Does that help? Thank you so much. Thank you, Shiona. We all really enjoyed your class. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, that's it? Yeah. I know that I saw other people lined up for questions, so I'll stand around outside if you guys still want to ask them because you came yeah. all this way, so I want to answer the questions. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Wait, can I take a picture of this audience really quickly? I mean, you guys don't look very fun. And I know, uh, I heard Nigerians are really fun, so. Okay, now I'm gonna do a video. So I wanna hear everybody, ready? Go. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>